I recently took an Instagram story poll taking a survey on how our community was feeling in the moment. I called it a vibe check. The options were, I'm feeling amazing. I'm in a season of struggle. I'm feeling burned out AF, aka as fuck, (laughs) and changing internal seasons. 60% of you plant friends selected that either you were struggling or feeling extremely burned out. So to the members of this community that are in a season of struggle, who are feeling low, who might be feeling off or out of alignment or blue. You are so not alone, my friend. (laughs) I see you. I see you so deeply because frankly, I am coming out of a season that pretty much lasted for the last three years of deep depression and severe burnout, like scary burnout. And I would define most of 2021 and 2022 for me in as in a season of struggle. But here's the thing, plant friends, the sun came out. I'm finally feeling better. I have done so much work and a huge part of this healing journey for me has been making major life shifts that have been centered around spending more time in and with nature and returning to slower, more natural rhythms and cycles. So although many of these episodes on the Growing Joy with Plants podcast are more lighthearted on topics like growing lettuce or spring houseplant care, today we are going to dive deep. So deep into a truth that has grown such deep roots within me that plants are so much more than interior decor pieces or landscaping pieces. They are an invitation to come back to ourselves. Caring for plants is an invitation to reconnect with a part of ourselves that modern society ignores, that has forced to go dormant. Because we are nature, plant friends. Listen, hear me out. We breathe. We have DNA. We have a vascular system that moves fluids around our body, right? Well, let me tell you, so do trees. Trees breathe. Trees have DNA. Trees have xylem and phloem pushing the nutrients it needs around their bodies. We are nature. It's why we feel so connected to nature. We see nature. We see life. And we see ourselves reflected in it. It's why caring for plants is so powerful. And it's why when you are in a season of burnout, when you are in a season of being off, plants can be such a huge tool, a free, accessible, easy tool to turn towards yourself again, to turn towards nature and towards yourself and away from the overstimulation, the crazy schedule, all of these external factors that might have gotten you here. So I hope in today's episode, we help you take one step towards making you feel a little better. Welcome to the Growing Joy podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives. I'm Maria, author of Growing Joy, the Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, an epic plant killer turned happy plant lady. On Growing Joy, you'll find conversations about plant care, plant community, and wellness through the lens of plants. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Oh, sweet plant friends, welcome. Welcome back to the podcast. If you're new here, welcome home. Welcome to the Growing Joy with Plants podcast, where I help you grow plants and cultivate joy. And if you're returning, I'm so happy that you chose play on today's episode. I have to say, there's part of me that's a little bit nervous. It's a solo episode. I'm going to be very vulnerable. We're going to talk about very deep stuff on today's episode. But I feel like it's time. I'm just feeling this full body, okay, this is the episode that we need to create in this week because someone needs to hear this episode in order to take the next step towards reconnecting with nature and reconnecting with themselves. And I'm so excited to dive in, even though I'm a little nervous. It's been such a wild year, plant friends. It's been such a wild few years, honestly. I think, you know, I am, I'm having so many conversations with my circle of friends or this community of listeners, and I'm hearing these phrases over and over again. I'm so burned out. I can't do this anymore. I'm mentally exhausted. I'm running on fumes. I'm so tired. I don't know what to do with my life. What is my purpose? So many conversations around purpose. And frankly, plant friends, I think our nervous systems have really been through it in the last three years. And I think we've been in such a state of fight or flight for everything that we've gone through with the pandemic that so many of us, I feel like, are finally starting to come up for this breath of fresh air or just this moment, and it's hitting us. And I really feel like nature and plants are going to be such a larger part of the conversation for our world, our society, as we all kind of come to terms with how unsustainable the way we've been operating has been and how we got to turn back to nature. We got to turn back to the OG, the OG way that we used to be because we are nature plant friends. Society has got run away a little bit 
but we are nature. So if you're in this season of life where you're thinking any of those phrases that I just recently said, I just want to say, I so see you. I'm so here with you. I've heard this from so many members of our community. You are not alone. And like I mentioned, I myself am coming out of a season of severe burnout, like couldn't get out of bed burnout, like completely lost my passion for everything that I thought I enjoyed at one point for houseplants, at one point for podcasting, at one point for everything. And that's what I've learned is a severe symptom of burnout is complete loss of passion for the things that used to love. A little over a year ago, I definitely hit a breaking point with my burnout and also with depression that I was struggling with. I hit a breaking point. But like Kendall said in my favorite Peloton instructor, she said, when you break, you break through. I hit a breaking point and I needed to get help. I sought the help of a therapist and a coach, and I was able to really identify the deep burnout that I was in. And over the last year, a little bit over a year, I've been making these lifestyle shifts that have truly changed my life. That breaking point really did become this invitation to step into a life that was way more amazing than anything I thought that I could be living. Right now, in this moment of my life, I can say I've never been happier. I've never been more fulfilled. I've never been more passionate to, for helping this community. I've never felt more excited about plants. I've never felt more inspired by my garden. I've never felt more lit up. And it's because of all of these shifts that I've made towards nature and away from bad habits and ingrained habits and societal beliefs. So I thought it was time to make a podcast dedicated to this topic. It's a solo podcast. I'm walking you through many of the practices that I talk about in my book, Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness. It's a self-help book. For those of you that don't know, I'm an author. I wrote a book. I feel like I don't talk about my book enough, but it's called Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness. It's a self-help book. There are 60 practices in my book about how you can use plants to live a happier life. And today we're gonna go through a bunch of the practices that I think are so beautifully tailored for burnout and learning how to overcome burnout and learning how to refine your nervous system and refine yourself. And I really hope it helps. I personally do all of the things that I'm talking about today. So I can personally, I am a personal testament to this work. And I know so many members of this community are a personal testament to this work because you're all writing me your stories about how plants have changed your life. And you're so dang inspiring, I can't even stand it. Before we dive in, I just want to also say thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for showing up to this podcast on a weekly basis. It's like my ultimate life's honor to be able to do this professionally, to make these podcasts for you, to help our community care for plants successfully and grow more joy. I've loved also getting to know this member, this community of listeners. We have this amazing international community of listeners, and you're all so nice. You're all so nice and special and sensitive and tender and kind. And I just wanted to give a shout out to three listeners who recently joined the Growing Joy Garden Society, Susan G, Shell M, and Kevin L. These are our newest members of the Growing Joy Garden Society. If you don't know what that is, it's my online community. It's my online platform. It's an iOS and an Android app. There's three goals of the platform. It's to help you make new plant friends, propagate your knowledge, and grow more joy in your life. It's just the sweetest. I call it the kindest and plantiest corner of the internet. If you want to join us, you can go to jointhegardensociety.com. All right, we dive in. Are you ready, plant friends? Are you ready to go deep with me? Because here we go. So today's episode on overcoming burnout with plants and nature, we've got to start with the definition of burnout. But before that, plant friends, I need to tell you two things. Number one, I'm recording this podcast episode with my office door open to my balcony because that is a big thing that I do every day to grow joy in life and overcome my burnout because I like to listen to bird song. So in today's episode, the audio quality might be different. You might hear some bird song. You might hear the hum of the hummingbird's wings that come to the hummingbird feeder right outside my door. You might hear my wind chime, but I wanted to record this episode in integrity in the way that I operate in my office, and that's with my door open. So it's not gonna be like a completely silent episode. You might get to hear some of the birds outside chirping. Two, <laughs> an important disclaimer. I'm going to share with you the practices that have helped me and that I can confidently say have changed my life, but I am not a doctor. I am not a guru. Like I've said before, I am walking this path alongside you. That is my constant commitment to you, that I am your biggest advocate and I am walking this path alongside you. I've done a lot of deep work in the last two years. I moved from 500 square feet in New York City to five acres in the country. I learned to garden. I addressed my screen addiction. I separated my self-worth from my job. I've done a lot. I have so much that I want to share with you kind of like in an older sister way of like, hey, let me tell you what's worked for me. But if you are in a season of struggle and you need help, please get support. 
I went through this process with the support of a therapist, a psychiatrist, a life coach, a partner, a husband who held me in so much, so much struggle. So get support. I'm here for you as your planty friend, but also when you need it, get support. I love you so much. Okay. I think everybody could use just like a little bit of therapy in their life, right? Wouldn't the world be great if everybody had a little bit of therapy? But anyway, I digress. Okay. An episode on burnout. So we have to start this episode about how to overcome burnout with nature and plants with a definition of burnout. We hear the word burnout in conversations and articles. It's being talked about. It's a huge epidemic in corporate America, right? But what is burnout? So I've been playing around with ChatGPT. <laughs> so I asked ChatGPT what burnout is, and this is the definition it told me. So burnout is a psychological, physical, and emotional state of chronic exhaustion and depletion resulting from prolonged periods of excessive stress, overwhelmed workload, or a feeling of being unable to meet constant demands. I mean, who doesn't feel like that? <laughs> These days, burnout is characterized by a sense of being emotionally drained, mentally exhausted, and lacking motivation or energy to cope with daily responsibilities. Burnout typically occurs in high pressure environments, such as at the workplace, but it can also affect individuals in other areas of life. It often manifests as a combination of physical, emotional, and cognitive symptoms impacting both personal well being and professional performance. So that's the fancy definition of burnout. And now I'm going to give you my definition of burnout, having gone through it. In my opinion, and in my personal experience, we experience burnout when we prioritize everything else around us over ourselves. We become disconnected from ourselves. We become disembodied. We separate ourselves from nature. And P.S., I'm going to say this a hundred times, but we are nature. So we disconnect ourselves from the nature that is ourselves. We prioritize everything else and we get completely lost. We expend too much. We deplete our tanks. We run on fumes and we're left with just the dregs. It sucks. It's the worst feeling. I'm speaking from experience here. You know, that term running on fumes, to me, that's what burnout feels like. It's just like you got nothing left. And in my opinion, we arrive here. We arrive at burnout because we're turning away from ourselves and towards external factors, whether for validation or just because life is hard and sometimes you got to do a lot of things. And from my research, which I'm about to share with you, burnout recovery is essentially reclaiming our right to connect with ourselves to be balanced after this period of imbalance. Then I asked ChatGPT, how do you heal burnout? What are the common, you know, articles written about healing burnout? And it told me things like, to heal burnout, you need to address mental, physical, and emotional effects of it. Step one is just recognizing and accepting that you have burnout, that you might be burned out. And then it's really about evaluating your life and figuring out how you got here, and then unwinding yourself from how you got here and figuring out how to move forward in a more sustainable way. That's through self-care, through evaluating your workload, figuring out if your workload is healthy, if you're in a healthy work environment, practicing stress management, which takes resting your body and allowing it to heal, and re-engaging with hobbies that you enjoy. And that's where I come in, plant friends, because there's no other joy more joyful hobby than caring for plants. Am I right? So I think where plants come in is helping you re-engage with your hobbies, helping you use mindfulness techniques and practice self-care. So here is the big realization that I found. I was doing research for my book and I learned about this theory and it blew my freaking mind and it changed the way I go about my day-to-day -day life. This sounds like an enormous statement, but it is so true, plant friends. Once I learned about attention restoration theory, my life changed. I changed the way I moved throughout the world. So here it is. Attention restoration theory. It's a theory pioneered by a husband and wife team, actually, Dr. Stephen and Dr. Rachel Kaplan. And here's what it's about. Attention restoration theory is about attention. The Kaplans state that there's really two different types of attention, involuntary and directed. And in order to have a balanced nervous system, in order to be at peace, we need to have a proper balance of the amount of time throughout the day that we use directed attention and involuntary attention. And when you get feelings of being burned out or mentally exhausted, sometimes that's a sign that you're using too much directed attention and not involuntary attention. So let's dive deeper into that. What is directed attention? So directed attention is about focus. It's voluntary. It requires effort. And it's also super important for us. We need directed attention in order to complete tasks. It's crucial for our existence, right? The second type of attention is called involuntary attention. And that's, in my opinion, where the secret sauce is, because I think 
because our society is so screen addicted these days, we're not experiencing involuntary attention enough. And that's where this imbalance happens. And that's often where this feeling of burnout or exhaustion can come from, in my opinion. So involuntary attention also can sometimes be called fascination. It's effortless. It's sustainable. When you're in a stimulating environment that you can naturally engage in, like watching clouds cross the sky, or if you're taking a walk in nature and you see a butterfly pass and you just kind of like admire the butterfly passing, but it just kind of like washes over you, you don't need to focus directly on anything, but you can absorb what's going on in a stimulating environment around you. That's involuntary attention. And it can be incredibly restorative. Okay, so I am always on the hunt for new podcasts to listen to, and I figured if you're listening to this podcast, you might be too. So if you're looking for another show that nourishes your soul, then you have to check out No Small Endeavor, produced by my friends at Great Feeling Studios and PRX. No Small Endeavor explores what it means to live meaningfully just like this show. In each episode, award-winning professor and host Lee C. Camp brings you thoughtful conversations with artists, philosophers, and theologians like The Office actor Rain Wilson and West Wing's Michael Sheen about what it means to truly flourish. If you need a place to start, I highly recommend their recent episode with New York Times bestselling author Gretchen Rubin. The conversation is all about what it takes to be happy day by day. So go ahead, plant friend. Go follow No Small Endeavor on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and tell them I sent you. That's no small endeavor. Okay, so I am always on the hunt for new podcasts to listen to, and I figured if you're listening to this podcast, you might be too. So if you're looking for another show that nourishes your soul, then you have to check out No Small Endeavor, produced by my friends at Great Feeling Studios and PRX. No Small Endeavor explores what it means to live meaningfully just like this show. In each episode, award-winning professor and host Lee C. Camp brings you thoughtful conversations with artists, philosophers, and theologians like The Office actor Rain Wilson and West Wing's Michael Sheen about what it means to truly flourish. If you need a place to start, I highly recommend their recent episode with New York Times bestselling author Gretchen Rubin. The conversation is all about what it takes to be happy day by day. So go ahead, plant friend, go follow No Small Endeavor on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and tell them I sent you. That's no small endeavor. So when I learned about this, I realized personally I was spending way too much time in directed attention and not enough time in involuntary attention. And when I learned that, I realized, okay, I think I need to, in order to restore my internal balance, I need to find ways to create more opportunity for involuntary attention in my life. And really where that came from was nature and plants. We're going to go through this entire episode is pretty much dedicated to involuntary attention, really. But this series of practices that I'm going to share with you are ways that you can allow yourself to enjoy involuntary attention in order to try and find a little bit more balance in your life. So I hope this helps. All right. So let's dive into some practices. I've waxed poetic enough. The first one that I'm going to talk about is look at a plant before you look at a screen. Now, if you've read my book, you know that this is like the first chapter. And I started by saying, if you take anything away from this book, please let it be this. Look at a plant before you look at a screen in the morning. It is so simple. This is the simplest idea. It's the simplest practice. And it is shockingly hard to do. Because so many of us have our alarms on our phones and our calendars and our email and our notifications, so many of us wake up and immediately engage with a screen. And when you do that, you literally have no agency throughout the day. You're basically waking up and you're giving your agency away and you're allowing these external stimuli to flood you and you never allow yourself like a tender moment alone with yourself in the morning. That's where that involuntary attention can come in. So my biggest challenge for you, if you are struggling, if you are in a season of burnout, please, 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 please try for a week, 30 days ideally, but even just give me a week, look at a plant before you look at a screen in the morning. I promise you, you're going to feel shifts in your life. This was the biggest shift I made, okay? And listen, I still struggle with this. I am a screen-addicted millennial. I still struggle with this. I have to put my phone in a different room. I got an alarm clock. There are different strategies for doing this that I outline in my book. But look at a plant before you look at a screen. And there's multiple ways that you can do that. You can get outside, right? So you can literally... You can look at plants. You can go outside in nature. When you wake up in the morning, the first thing you do, go outside. If you have, you know, a yard, 
take a deep breath in, smell some fresh air, listen to some bird song, experience sunlight in your eyes. That's apparently very good for you. Look at the blue sky and just have a moment with yourself. Just create some space for yourself in nature, right? That's the ideal. That's the ideal thing we could do. I like to, when I get up in the morning, I go downstairs because I make my husband and I coffee in the morning. And while I'm boiling my kettle of water, I go step out on my balcony and I thank my trees in the morning. So I have these beautiful trees on my property. We watched a movie one day called, I think it's called My Neighbor Totoro. It's an animated film. And in the film, there's this sweet scene where the characters bow to the trees at their new home and say, thank you for protecting us. And my husband really liked it. So we thank the trees every morning, (laughs) which is really, really beautiful. But it's a beautiful way to connect with nature and like start my day off with nature. Also gratitude in general, whether you're thanking the trees or whether you're just being thankful for things that you have, you can make a gratitude list. You can run, have a running list of, you know, as you're brushing your teeth, you can be just in your mind saying, thank you for the roof above my head. Thank you for my partner. Thank you for my job. Thank you for my beautiful eyes. Thank you for my body. But gratitude is such a powerful perspective shifter. When you're in a season of life where you think everything isn't going your way, I challenge you to find one thing that is going your way. And it can be as simple as a roof over your head. If you can't get outside, I understand that. I used to live in 500 square feet in New York City. I didn't have any outdoor space. (laughs) And that's where houseplants come in, right? So look at a plant before you look at a screen. Get up, go make your coffee, and go chill with your houseplants for a minute. Create some space. You can put on a little bit of music if you want, but go engage with your plants. And part of that is also ritualizing, engaging with nature on a daily basis. I, in my book, have a chapter called How to Create a Plant Care Self-Care Routine. We'll start with the plant aspect of it. You know, ritualizing going outside, spending some time in your garden, weeding, drinking your coffee in your garden, going on a short walk, thanking your trees the way I do. That's great outdoors. A plant care self-care routine for me is a little bit more focused on indoor plant parenthood, but that's where you're getting up in the morning and you're committing to engaging with your plants once a day. And that's not watering your plants. That's engaging with your plants once a day. We don't want to overwater our plants. And you create this like sacred time in the morning where you're away from your phone, engaging with nature and therefore engaging with yourself. Because once again, I'm going to sound like a broken record. We are nature plant friends. So in that sacred time in the morning. And we're talking five minutes, guys. We're not talking like three hours. Don't worry. Here are a few things you can think about doing. If your plants need to be watered, you can water your plants, but don't do it unless they need to be watered. But when you're checking the soil, can you use that as an opportunity to be super mindful? And instead of just shoving your finger in the soil and pulling it out to see if it's wet, can you like take a deep breath and actually put your finger on the soil and feel the sensation of rubbing the soil between your two fingertips and Noticing, is it cool? Because normally cool soil is moist soil, or is it just kind of room temperature? Then it's probably dry. Can you turn just like that measurement of your soil moisture into a mindful moment? So you can measure your soil moisture with your finger. Water, you can wipe your plant's leaves. Plant's leaves accumulate so much dust and dirt. Also, checking your plant's leaves on a daily or weekly basis is good because that's normally where you can see pest outbreaks show up. Can you just simply admire your plant? Can you pick your plant up and hold it up to the sun and maybe look at it from below so you actually get to see the veins of the plant and see it from a different perspective? And while you're looking at this plant from a different perspective, can you take a moment and think, huh, is there any aspect of my life that I'm thinking about in a certain way that I could offer a different perspective in this moment, right? These plant care, self-care parallels. So when you water your plants, can you water yourself? Have you drank? (laughs) Are there aspects of your life that are thirsty that need to be hydrated, right? There's a plant life parallel in every opportunity in nature, I promise you. I've yet to find a thing in nature that could not be a plant life parallel. And you can challenge me. You can DM me with that, with a challenge. Can you do like a really intentional check for pests? Can you do a breathing exercise as your eyes trace the outlines of Arafidophora tetrasperma or a monstera, right? I always recommend the box breath for a breathing exercise. It's simple. You just breathe in for four, you hold for four, you exhale for four, you hold for four. Breathe in for four, hold for four, exhale for four, hold for four. Can you meditate with your plants, right? That could be part of your plant care, self-care routine, that you just surround yourself with plants as you're meditating or as you're journaling or as you're doing your gratitude journal. That was a huge part of my life when I lived in New York City. I would surround it by my plants with my journal in the morning, and I would just like write a list of things I was thankful for. And then obviously, if you have a garden, it's easy to look at a plant before you look at a screen, especially in the growing season. There's a million garden chores that you could be doing. 
So that's ritualize engaging with nature. The more time you spend with nature, the more time you're going to find that involuntary attention, the more you will start feeling better. I promise. (laughs) Another opportunity for overcoming burnout is to get outside. Plant friends, get outside. Outside is so amazing. (laughs) I talk about this practice called forest bathing in my book. It's a Japanese art called Shinrin Yoku, which translates to forest bathing, and it's going out into the forest and letting your five senses be bathed in the forest, in nature. So this isn't going for a run in your local park with Snapchat open and a podcast going, and you're not really paying attention. There's no end point. There's not a certain amount of steps that you have to get. Forest bathing can be going and sitting in the forest or in a park, but it's allowing yourself to have your five senses engaged, surrounded by nature. So let's take sitting, for example. Say you go and you take your lunch and you have your lunch in a park instead of in your office, right? What do you hear? So if you take a few deep breaths or you're maybe walking at a slow, comfortable place, what do you hear? Do you hear the bird song? Do you hear maybe laughter of children playing? Do you hear rustling of the leaves in the wind, the crunching of leaves under your feet, right? What do you smell? Go up to a tree and rub its leaves or its pine needles in your hands and then smell. Can you kind of use some of those aromatics as a way to calm your nervous system? Taste, you got to be careful. I'm not going to tell you to go taste the soil, but can you taste the air? One of my favorite doctors who's a forest bathing professional talks about, can you taste the air, the fresh air? What does it taste like in your mouth? What do you see? How many different shades of green can you spot? If you look at the bark of a tree, you will be so surprised at how many colors are in what you thought was just brown. Tree bark has pinks, yellows, reds, browns, greens. It's incredible if you just go up to a tree and look at its bark. So that's taste here. Oh, and touch. Can you have that mindful moment with soil? Can you touch the bark of a tree? Can you enjoy like the fuzzy leaf, right? But how can you just engage all five of your senses? Because the more senses you engage, the more of yourself is alive, the more connected you are to yourself, right? And that's really what we're looking for. If, you know, we're working on my definition of burnout is a disconnection from yourself. We want to light up as many sides of yourself as you can to reacquaint yourself with yourself through nature. My God, how many, take a drink every time I say yourself in this podcast episode. If it rains, go for a walk after it rains. There is that beautiful earthy smell after it rains called petrichor, and it's actually the activation of geosmin, which is a compound that's released by bacteria in the soil. And when it gets wet, it makes the smell called petrichor, and that's that like post-rain earthy delicious smell. And our nervous systems as humans, we love that smell. We can sense that smell more than we can sense other things. There's like research about it in my book. I'm not going to get into that, but you obviously, I mean, that post-rain smell, I think if you've ever smelled it, you understand how delicious that is. So after it rains, go for a quick walk and just take your, allow yourself to take some deep breaths. You know, on social media, there's been all of this like trending viral stuff about mental health walks, but man, you know, a lot of these tropes, a lot of these things that we hear about all the time, they're famous for a reason. Mental health walks are getting talked about for a reason. Getting yourself outside and going for a walk in nature once a day will be so restorative for you, even if it's just 10 minutes. And listen, I understand if you're living in the city, if you don't have access to nature, I would argue you probably have a tree on your street. I mean, I lived in 500 square feet in New York City. There were six trees on our blocks, but I would go have mindful moments with those trees. You can go have a mindful moment with one tree. You don't need to go to the medicinal forests in Japan to experience forest bathing. You really don't. You can do it. And if you don't have any access to green space, engage with your houseplants. Take a break. Go have lunch with your houseplants. Go take a five-minute break with your houseplants and do the plant care self-care practices I just talked about. Get your bare feet on the earth. Oh my gosh, plant friends, grounding. Grounding is so powerful. I've started doing it. I do it every day when it's warm out, (laughs) when it's warm enough, when my earth isn't frozen. Basically, the earth has this electrical current that runs through it. And our bodies, you know, our grandparents, grandparents, grandparents were walking around barefoot, right? So our skin is able to absorb that electrical energy. And the way that we are connected to the earth is through connecting with its energy. And rubber-soled shoes have disconnected us to that. So grounding or earthing is the practice of putting your bare feet or your bare hands on the earth and reconnecting with the earth's energy. It's so good for you. People talk about using it when you travel as a way to deal with jet lag. But if I'm having like a sluggish day and I just need a pick-me-up in the middle of the afternoon, I will go outside, put my feet on the ground, take 10 deep breaths, and then go back inside. 
earthing. Oh God, it's so good. It's free too, plant friends. All you got to do is go find a little patch of grass and put your bare feet on the earth and you're going to feel so good. Take some deep breaths, say a few prayers of gratitude and get on with your day, right? It doesn't take a long time and it's totally free. I have a very fancy, and I'm, I'll be honest with you, it's expensive, PEMF mat, pulsed electromagnetic field mat that I've also been using in the winter. So I have six to eight months of winter where I cannot go outside and put my feet on the earth. And the process of earthing was so transformative for me that I didn't want to disconnect myself from that. So this company called Higher Dose makes this PEMF mat. I'll link to it in the show notes in case you want to check it out. But I actually have this PEMF mat and it mimics the earth's electrical current. And I laid on it in the winter for 30 minutes a day. And I would lay on it like when I was going to bed or if I was meditating in the morning. But it was really nice to be able to engage with at least that current, that frequency, if I wasn't able to have my bare feet on the ground when we had two feet of snow. All right, moving on. Practice mindfulness through plant care. So engaging in plant care activities, it can serve as a mindfulness practice in its own. Mindful gardening, right? There's a reason why everyone says gardening is my therapy. Houseplants are my therapy, right? Because you have to practice mindfulness when you're with them. Practicing mindfulness with your plants, whether it's outdoors, whether it's indoors, whether it's in nature, it's just an opportunity to be fully present and immersed in the moment. No screens, no podcasts, no TV on in the background, right? Just give yourself some freaking space. I know it's scary. It can be really scary. It was really scary for me. I went through a year where I was so burned out and so depressed. I could not be with alone with my thoughts at all. I was watching repeats of Parks and Recreation in the background when I made lunch because I couldn't just be alone with my thoughts. I hear you, plant friends. I hear you. I see you if you're in this period of struggle of this overstimulation. But I just offer to you if you can take that itchy moment, if you can let it be itchy for a minute, if you can let it be uncomfortable and start to disconnect yourself from that constant overstimulation and stimuli, you will not be disappointed. You will be so thankful. I am so thankful I stopped that habit. And listen, I still love TV. I watch a ton of TV, but I'm way more in control of it and I'm not numbing and I allow myself to listen to bird song and to just listen to nothing, to just be in the absence of nothing. It's so good for your nervous system. And when you're burned out, like just let yourself sit and have no thoughts. Just like let yourself sit and stare out the window. It's so good. So being mindful with your plants, obviously that means observing their growth. You're fully plugged in. You're fully present with them. You're observing their growth. You're observing what happens when you water them. You're being mindful of the yellow and the brown leaves and you're removing them. And when you're removing them, you're letting go of stressful thoughts and you're letting go of things that aren't serving you. And when you're pruning back your plants, you're realizing, God, what in my life do I need to prune back right now? When you're removing yellow leaves or brown leaves, you're thinking, gosh, what toxic habits do I need to let go of? Do I need to remove in order to be a happier and healthier human plant? Yes. I'm going to leave that there. I'm going to move on. DM me and let me know how that goes for you. Okay, so I am always on the hunt for new podcasts to listen to, and I figured if you're listening to this podcast, you might be too. So if you're looking for another show that nourishes your soul, then you have to check out No Small Endeavor, produced by my friends at Great Feeling Studios and PRX. No Small Endeavor explores what it means to live meaningfully just like this show. In each episode, award-winning professor and host Lee C. Camp brings you thoughtful conversations with artists, philosophers, and theologians like The Office actor Rain Wilson and West Wing's Michael Sheen about what it means to truly flourish. If you need a place to start, I highly recommend their recent episode with New York Times bestselling author Gretchen Rubin. The conversation is all about what it takes to be happy day by day. So go ahead, plant friend. Go follow No Small Endeavor on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and tell them I sent you. That's no small endeavor. Hot take plant friends. There is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test, because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible, so I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. 
After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. I also have like two chapters in my book on a deeper dive of that if you want to go into that. But how long is this episode? I don't want to spend two hours, you know, waxing poetic about being mindfulness with plants. Okay. This one was a surprising one for me. When I was doing research for my book, it was definitely something that I did not do before I did research for Growing Joy. I learned about the power of scent and how incredible the power of scent is for our brains. We just released an episode on aromatic gardening. I highly recommend going back and listening to Amy. She's an expert. She talks deeply about the olfactory system and how our nose is connected to our brain and how important plant scents can be for us. VOCs, volatile organic compounds, they're how plants communicate with each other, basically through scent. I dive deeply into that in my book as well, but I really want to focus on actionable practices for you today and not like confusing science. So high level, what you need to know is scent and smelling plants will really make you feel so much better. There are different scents for different people. Some people love lavender and it actually is very relaxing for them. Some people hate it, right? So I'm jumping into this section about scent also just saying, hey, listen, scent is very powerful, but it's also very personal. So, you know, commonly known plant scents that are very relaxing are things like lavender, chamomile, jasmine, right? I just harvested a bunch of fresh chamomile and Billy and I were rubbing the flowers in our hands because it smells so freaking good. Those tend to have calming and soothing aromas. Rosemary and eucalyptus tend to be more invigorating. You can use essential oils. You can grow your own herbs and dry them and use those. You can clip fresh herbs and have them with you. You can grow scented houseplants. You can grow Hoya that have amazing scented blooms or orchids that have amazing scented blooms. The world of scents and plants is so wide and vast, but I highly recommend if you're not engaging your sense of smell with your plant collection or just throughout your day, I highly recommend it. When I was going through this period of burnout and depression, I was mixing different combinations of essential oils and putting them into a diffuser every day. And I just had nice plant scents supporting me throughout my workday and helping me just like get through the day. I fell in love with an oil called Hinoki oil. Hinoki is a Japanese tree. I believe it's a cypress tree, but it's this like lemony, piney, delicious scent. And Hinoki oil was very therapeutic for me. I have a list of scents in my book, but that's a really good place to start. There's a million different ways you can diffuse essential oils. You could put them in your humidifiers if you have them for your houseplants. You can put them in diffusers, those little reed diffusers. It can contact, if you're not sensitive to essential oils, you can put them on your skin. I'm not sensitive to them, so I put them on my wrist. There's a million ways, but also just like grow scented plants, right? Two other things I want to offer you before I sign off. I know I've been talking for a long time. I think there's two different types of plants that we should all have in our collections for two different reasons for healing purposes, slow burn plants and quick win plants. So a slow burn plant is a plant that you will learn so many lessons from, my plant friend. These plants tend to be house plants or tend to be outdoor plants like a peony where you plant it, but that baby isn't going to flower for a couple of years. I was just having a conversation with a friend about how she feels so stuck and she's struggling because she feels so stuck in her day-to-day life, but she knows that she's made so much progress in her growth and development, but like she still just beats herself up and feels bad. And I told her this story about this green wall that I had in my apartment. I installed a green wall in my New York City apartment and I put plants in it and that green wall was in my sight line every day, right? And so I started taking it for granted and in the pandemic, 
I hope you all know my story by now, but if you don't, I lost my job, I canceled my wedding, and I moved in with my parents in the span of like two months. I My brain totally broke. And I was feeling so stuck and confused. And I was looking at my green wall one day and I was making a post about my green wall because I think I was posting for Wally Grow, the people who make the pockets. And so I was going through my phone and I was looking for old photos of the green wall. And I found the original photos of installing the green wall. And I realized that this green wall had grown so tremendously. And I had no idea. I had no acknowledgement or reverence or excitement about the growth that this green wall had gone through. The pothos, the leaves had gotten bigger and they had learned to attach to the wall and they were scrambling all over my wall. It was incredible. And they were baby little four inch pots when I planted them. But because I was seeing them on a day-to-day basis, I wasn't processing the growth that this green wall was going through. And I needed those pictures to go back and see oh my God, this green wall has grown so much. And it was this plant life moment where I was like, wow, I've grown a lot too. When you have those moments where you can't see your growth in the day-to-day, but you've got to just zoom out and see the big picture, these slow burn plants tend to be super helpful for those reminders. So if you're feeling stuck, you can go over to a slow growing plant you can see that it's alive. You can see that its leaves are erect. You can look back at an old picture and see how much it's grown and use it as a little metaphor for yourself. That has been very powerful and so simple for me. You can probably do it with a plant you already have too, right? So it's free. On the other side of that, I also think quick win plants can be so helpful, especially when you're in a real low moment. If you're struggling with depression or if you're struggling with like a really bad day of burnout, like you can't get out of bed, you're really struggling. I mean, what is more joyful than seeing a seed sprout or seeing a flower bloom, right? There's nothing more joyful. So these quick wind plants are faster growing plants that are really going to get moving, get moving and blooming and growing for you quickly. And seeing that, it'll reinvigorate you. I remember last year, we had such a brutal winter. It was March. I had no plans for seed starting. I started so many flower seeds purely for the experience of seeing a dormant seed burst forth with cotyledon and a few true leaves. I had no idea what I was going to do with all of those plants. I started so many sunflowers. I gave everybody I knew sunflowers that year. But I just needed to be in the presence of witnessing a seed germinating. That's just what I needed to do. It was so helpful. When I saw those seeds germinate, it just gave me so much hope. And I think that seed starting experience can be so hopeful for so many of us. If you don't want to start seeds, I hear you. Force bulbs. You can force bulbs, get some paper whites, get some tulips, get some hyacinths, daffodils. There are so many bulbs you can buy at the grocery store at the garden center that are already conditioned so that all you have to do is put them in a vase with some pebbles at the bottom, water them, and they will grow. And when those bulbs start growing, they grow day by day, you know, like amaryllis are some of my favorite plants to get in the wintertime because they grow so quickly. And then you get to watch this unfolding of this huge, gorgeous flower when there's two feet of snow outside, right? Another, what I consider a quick win plant is edible food. It's a win-win because number one, you grow food and then you eat it. And that's an incredibly empowering experience. But also a tomato plant's life cycle is three months. A monstera's life cycle is so many years and maybe in three months you'll get one leaf. So you get to see something go from seed or seedling to a flower, to a fruit, to something that is on your table in a very short amount of time. Radishes, you can grow radishes in 30 days, right? You can take a seed and have a radish on your plate in 30 days. So that can be a very empowering experience. Also super fun to do with kids. But if you need that, if you're feeling like, you know, your soul is dormant, that you're just feeling disconnected and sad, that experience of seeing something burst forth, seeing life burst forth in front of you can be extremely empowering and inspiring. And I I offer you that practice. I want to leave you with a saying that I feel like I get a little blue in the face about, but I'm going to say it again because I don't think you can think, I don't think you can hear the story too many times, my plant friends, but it's the concept of pruning back to inspire growth. So when we prune plants, we'll take basil for an example. I hope many of you have grown basil before. And if not, I highly recommend growing it. It's the greatest. Plants, it's very counterintuitive, but plants need to be pruned in order to grow into fuller, bushier versions of themselves. So with a basil plant, You cut it back, you remove part of the basil plant, but what happens is when you cut it, it triggers this growth hormone, auxin, to flood the plant and trigger this lateral bushy growth. And 
once that growth comes in, that basil becomes a fuller, more robust, more vibrant plant than it was before you pruned it. So you have to make the plant smaller in order to let the plant become a better, fuller version of itself. So if you are in this period of burnout, of depression, of a season of struggle, I just want to offer you that something is getting pruned away in your life right now, or you need to prune something in your life right now in order to step into a more fully realized version of yourself. And I know that sounds scary. I've been there, as I've mentioned, all of the loss that I've endured in the last couple of years and all of the pivots. You're also completely in the dark. I heard Glennon Doyle say on a podcast, you know, going into recovery for addiction is like jumping off of a cliff and just needing to have pure faith that your future self is going to catch you. Your future self who has dealt with your addiction is going to catch you. Pruning something, you have to just have full faith that that oxen and that plant is going to do what it's supposed to do. And it can be so scary in that moment of pruning. But time and time again, the growth comes and you don't see it until it's ready to reveal itself to you. So if you're in a season of struggle, I'm here for you. I see you. My DMs are open. My email is open. I love this community so much. My heart hurts. When I saw that Instagram feedback, my heart hurt. It made me so sad. Not sad, but I felt it. I felt it. I felt your pain. So I hope that this episode has shared a couple of actionable, free, easy things that you can do today. You can take something I talked about today and just start doing it and commit to yourself. Commit to yourself for 30 days. And if not 30 days, give me seven days. Give me seven days of looking at a plant before looking at a screen or incorporating plant scents into your day or starting some seeds. Take a little seed packet, go buy a 99 cent seed packet and pop it in the soil, right? I believe in you. I'm here for you. Your growth is coming. Your growth is coming. I know it. I know it. I know it. I'm holding that vision for you. If this podcast resonated with you, my book, Growing Joy, is your soulmate. (laughs) My book is tons of plant life lessons that I've learned and 60 practices that you can immediately start doing that are all affordable and easy to help you grow more joy in your life and come back to yourself. Because my goal is to grow kinder people by helping you disconnect from screens and turn towards nature, which means turning towards yourself. Also, I am sharing a lot of this stuff on my social media. On Instagram and TikTok, you can find me at Growing Joy with Maria. If you need daily inspiration, if you want to see me daily cold plunging and me daily looking at plants before I look at a screen, come follow me on Instagram and TikTok. I can be there for you. DM me. I got you. I got your back. I love you. I love you so much. I love this community so much. I'm here for you. I hope this episode helped. If it did help, share it with a friend. If you have a friend who's going through a season of struggle, share this episode with them. Give them my book (laughs) if you don't mind. But until next time, my sweet plant friends, keep blooming and keep growing. Plant friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show so you don't miss an episode. We have incredible episodes lined up in 2023, and I don't want you to miss one topic. And while you're subscribing, would you mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review? Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so I thank you in advance for helping this podcast reach as many planty earbuds as possible across the globe. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got a ton of free options for you. First, there's the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's so fun. It takes literally three minutes to complete. You take the test, you get your Plant Parent Personality Profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you, inspired by your results. The link is in the show notes. Make sure to let me know what your personality is after you take the test. If you're looking to up-level your plant parent game, check out my website. We've got a bunch of free guides that you can download on topics like understanding natural light, which is actually a three-day worksheet, and nine ways to clean up your office if you need to bring a little bit of planty joy into your work life. And finally, I want to invite you to join the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet, my online garden society. It's both a web platform and an iOS and Android app. It allows our listeners to get together in an algorithm and troll-free online online space to swap plant care tips, humble brag about plant wins, and get support when you have plant fails. We have monthly live planty show and tells on Zoom, which are so fun, and even have a living library of planty book recommendations sourced from our community. 
you can go to jointhegardensociety.com to grab your membership. And for anything else, plant friend, I am here for you. Feel free to drop me a line, whether you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe you're even a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, following me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and tips is always recommended. You can find me across socials at Growing Joy with Maria. Thank you again so much for listening. It is truly my honor and life's delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Make new plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group, so if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section, plus the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar, and literally every post ever created about Hoya will pop up so you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click Click the community plan. Hot take plant friends. There is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test, because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible, so I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. Mm-hmm. 